Okay, so this is the review session for EGME 442, spring 2022 for the uh, midterm exam. Okay, so I checked on the, uh, I checked on the uh, poll online and it turns out these are the top winning choices. And so, you know, these were all topics we covered recently. And so number one was impedance in vascular, uh, vascular networks. Number two was 1D equations of blood flow. And number three was oscillating flow in rigid vessels. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. And so, you know, all of these, you know, we're, we're all very recent stuff and, um, you know, I, and I can probably guess why these were, these were selected. And so, you know, I know that the mathematical derivations in, in these units was, uh, was very intense, right? And so there was a lot that we covered here. But remember, you know, for the midterm, I, I'm not gonna expect you to do any of the derivations or any of the, uh, uh, any of the math, right? Because I think, that's, I think that's kind of unfair without a, uh, you know, without a homework to back it up. Uh, what I am going to be interested in, in, is, in testing you on is the conceptual information that came with this. Okay. Okay. Uh, so unfortunately, you know, the, the, uh, these are out of order. And so it would be great to have 1D equations first, but, you know, well, I'll make, I want to make sure I, I give each of these topics, uh, you know, their, um, you know, their, uh, all, all the time that they need. And so, you know, I want to start from the top and what people requested the most. Okay. So let's start with impedance and vascular networks. Okay. Okay. And so this was the this was the, the the lecture notes that we covered directly after 1D equations. Okay. And so the 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 goal with this unit was um, was was a few, right? So we had kind of we had kind of a few goals with this, right? So the first goal, you know, according uh, you know, very consistent with the title of the of the notes, was to understand what is meant by impedance. Okay? And so based on the name, you know, you could tell that it has something to do with impeding something, right? So that's, that's, what the, that's where the name comes from. Um, and you could think of impedance as kind of like a, 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 more, generalized ver a more generalized concept um, to flow resistance. Okay? Because before, you know, we've uh, we've we've come up with this idea of resistance before, right? And so when we looked at our LPN networks, we had our resistors, and these resistors represented, uh, you know, resistance to flow, right? Because, um, you know, your your blood vessels are not these kind of, uh, you know, it's it's not a frictionless system, right? Uh, we know that, you know, if you just for solid mechanics, right? And so if you, if you have a frictionless system, you know, if you push something on a frictionless system, it's just going to keep going on forever, right? And so you have a wooden block, you know, on a, on a, uh, uh, and you can, you can kind of see this in, in like air hockey, right? And so if you have an air hockey puck, if you play air hockey before, right? If you push the air hockey puck a little bit, you know, it, it, it glides, right? And so it doesn't really stop until it hits the wall. Um, and so that's, that's an example of what a, a frictionless system would be like. And so your blood vessels aren't like that, right? And so you're not like your blood just has to pump just a little bit. And that drives blood everywhere, right? It takes the blood, it, it takes some work, right? So the, the heart actually has to work pretty hard because it has to push the blood through all of the blood vessels in your body. And all the blood vessels are providing some kind of resistance to that flow, okay? And it's that resistance that, um, you know, that causes your heart to work. Uh, and so before, you know, what we said was that this resistance uh, was mostly just due to viscous friction. And so we said that viscous friction was the main uh, was the main uh, culprit to this flow this flow resistance. Okay? Um, but in reality, you know, there's a lot more factors within the cardiovascular system, you know, that impedes blood flow. Right. So your heart, your heart, in other words, your heart is working against a lot more than just the um, than just the viscous resistance. Okay? And so that's the idea behind impedance.
besides resistance, besides viscous friction. Okay. And so some of those factors have to do with pressure, right? And so because the pressure is, um, you know, unsteady, right? And so that, that accounts for it. Some of that has to do with inertia of the blood, okay? So it always takes some time or, or it takes some work to, uh, to get the blood moving and to slow it down, okay? And part of that's also due to pressure wave propagation as well, right? So I guess I kind of mentioned that with pressure. Uh, but because pressure waves are propagating throughout the cardiovascular system, you know, as it propagates through, it kind of reflects back, that's also going to impede blood flow as well. And so this kind of this general concept of impedance accounts for all of these, all of these things. Okay, and so we'll go, we'll go through that a bit more you know, as, as we explore this, okay? But the other goal for this unit was to actually explore that exact, um, that exact thing, which is pressure wave propagation. And so we've learned before that, you know, because the, the blood vessels are, are flexible structures, they're deformable walls, you know, you're going to have these pressure waves that travel down the cardiovascular tree at a, at, a, at a fixed speed. But not only that, those pressure waves are actually going to reflect as well. Previously, what we thought of is that, you know, it's only, it's not until the pressure waves reach the very end of the tree, do those pressure waves start to start to reflect. Uh, but you will, but we'll see later on through this analysis that there are other parts of the cardiovascular tree where reflection can occur. Okay. And so, you know, there, I know there's a, there's a lot of information and a lot of uh, partial differential equations in the impedance nodes, but these are the main piece of information that you, that you should be looking out for. Okay. And I believe the study guide kind of shows, uh, kind of says the same things. Okay. And so, you know, just very quickly, you know, let's, let's, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through the whole derivation again, you know, but let's, we can uh, talk about just the, uh, just the idea behind it. Okay. And so the way that we obtained this information on impedance was that we took the one dimensional equations of blood flow. Okay. We took the one dimension, one dimension equations of blood flow, we linearized them, and so we, we made it a little bit easier to solve, and then we manipulated that equation in order to obtain the, the wave equation, okay? And so we know that pressure kind of travels along the cardiovascular tree like a wave. And so it would be great if we obtain, you know, a wave-like equation, you know, for us to solve, right? And so that's, that's kind of what we did, okay? Okay, and so in the end, uh, in the end, we kind of ended up with this, uh, you know, with this, with this algorithm, right? And so, you know, combining these two, uh, these two um, goals, you know, we came up with an algorithm that allowed us to compute the impedance in entire vascular tree, okay? Okay. And so, you know, again, you know, I'm not going to ask you to run through this algorithm. You know, in fact, you know, the, what we did in the class 
was a fairly simple example, right? Uh, and this is something that you would normally do with code because it involves, you know, um, calculations with complex numbers, which is normally pretty hard to, to do. Uh, but it is important to know uh, what this is in general. Plus, going through this process will kind of highlight all the different um, ideas that we talked about at the beginning. Okay. Okay. So, start number one. And so, number one, uh, the number one step to uh, computing the uh, impedance of a vascular tree is to obtain the terminal impedance of all the end vessels. Okay, and so if you have a system that looks like this, okay, you're going to look at all the vessels at the end, okay, okay. all the vessels at the end will have their terminal impedance, right? So remember, terminal impedance is given by Z sub T, okay. So each of those is going to have a different terminal impedance, um, and that again, you know, that's something that you would normally find through MATLAB, and that's going to be your starting point. Okay. The next step, step two, is that once you have those terminal impedances, you're going to compute the uh, reflection coefficient for each end vessel. Okay. Okay. Remember, the reflection coefficient is an expression of how much of the pressure wave gets reflected at that part of the tree. Right? And so our reflection coefficient here is gamma. I'm going to say this is equal to Z naught minus Z sub T divided by Z naught plus Z sub T. Okay. Where Z sub T here, of course, this is our terminal impedance. And Z naught, Z naught here is the characteristic impedance. Okay. okay. Remember in class, we talked about the difference between these two. And so if you have a vessel that looks like this, right? So here is a typical blood vessel. The terminal impedance would be whatever whatever impedance is at the you know at the outlets, right? So all the impedance downstream. Meanwhile, the characteristic impedance is going to be the impedance of the vessel of the vessel itself. Okay. Right, so every vessel is going to have a characteristic impedance because that's that represents how hard how hard it is to flow blood through that through that particular vessel. Okay. And I guess I should mention at this point too that the terminal impedance, traditionally the way that we compute it is we take the ratio of the pressure over the flow rate at the end of the vessel. Okay. Okay. And so if you think for a purely linear resistance or so for a purely viscous resistance that we have up here, right? There's going to be a consistent ratio. There's going to be a constant ratio between pressure and flow, right? And so the pressure and flow can change throughout the cardiovascular cycle, of course, you know, but that ratio is always going to be the same value, okay? That's when you have a purely, purely resistive case. Uh, but when you start to factor in these other factors that can, that can impede blood flow, uh, like the deformable walls, like the pressures, what you'll find out is that this impedance is not a constant it's not a constant uh, ratio, okay? Okay. 
because there's a lot more other factors out there than just viscous, uh, viscous friction, okay? And in fact, you know, what we say most of the time is that the impedance, uh, it depends very strongly on the frequency of the, of the, uh, of the pressure waves, right? And so the, heart, the faster your heart is beating or the slower your heart is beating, that's gonna produce a different amount of impedance because you know, these impedances are, are, are frequency dependent, okay? Okay, and so that's the difference between ZO and ZT. And so I'd say that's a pretty core, a pretty core idea with this unit, okay? And the other thing we have here is the reflection coefficient. And so, you know, what, and so the main takeaway I want you to get from this is that whenever there's a difference, or you see a difference in, in, in impedances, then, then, then you're gonna have at least some wave reflection, okay? Okay. Okay. And so that kind of sheds some more light on how pressure waves um, can propagate in a uh, uh, in a cardiovascular system. Okay. And so whenever you have a uh, um, whenever you have a difference in uh, in impedances, that's going to cause the pressure wave to reflect. Okay. Okay. We spent a lot of time on that on that step just because there was a lot of uh, other information to, to learn. Okay. Number three. Number three here is to use the reflection coefficient to find the input impedance of that vessel. Okay. And so, you know, if you were standing at the at the inlet of this vessel or at the beginning, right, right, and you're about to flow through, and so let's say that you're your blood cell, right, then the impede the total impedance that you'll find is the is a combination between the characteristic impedance and the terminal impedance. Okay, and so we had a formula that we had that uh, uh, you know that that formed the difference between these two. Okay, and so that formula was uh, was part of number number. Okay, and so basically, you need that you need the reflection coefficient, and you need the uh, the, the other uh, impedances, and so that's that's step number three. Okay. Oops. Okay, step number four. And so once the input impedances are found, you know a lot of times you're going to be in a situation where you know you're looking at possibly these two vessels here. Okay. Okay. You're gonna have the input impedance of this one, input impedance of that one, okay? What you need to do now is that before you kind of move on to the parent vessel or the one that's, uh, you know, that's, that's greater than this one, you're gonna to need to combine all the terminal, all the, all the input impedances of the, of the daughter vessels, okay? And most of the time, you're going to combine them in parallel, okay? Just like a parallel parallel resistors, okay? And so once you do that, then that combination of, of impedances now becomes the terminal impedance of the parent vessel, okay? Okay. All right, and so basically, you know, we have a situation like this. So we have a vessel like this, it's gonna bifurcate. Okay. Okay. 
First, we focus on this vessel. Okay. So let's say that we have a, a terminal impedance here, a characteristic impedance here. Okay. These two are going to combine. And then what you'll get from that is an input impedance for, for this for this daughter vessel here. Okay. Okay, you're gonna do the same thing for the other daughter. So the other daughter here. So we have a terminal impedance, we have a characteristic impedance. Those combine to give us an input impedance. Okay. Now what you're gonna do, now that you have all of the input impedances of the daughters, you're gonna combine these two. Okay, so this is step four. These two are gonna to combine to become the terminal impedance of this vessel right here, okay? Okay. And so now that we've kind of moved up at the tree, moved on to this parent vessel, you know, we know what his terminal impedance is, uh, is going to be, okay? And then from here, you just kind of repeat this whole process until you reach the top, until you reach the end of your tree, okay? Okay. All right, and so no matter how big your tree is, you can actually keep doing this process kind of over and over and over again. Okay. So I do, I actually do have an assignment. I, I don't think I'll actually assign it where, you know, I give you kind of a generic tree, a very, very large tree, and then you code up this, uh, this process in MATLAB, uh, you know, to, uh, to compute that, to compute that uh, impedance, okay? Okay, so these, so I, I think these are the main concepts that I want you to take away from impedance, right? And so, you know, again, you know, the, the mathematical details of the proof are not important. Uh, what's more important are these kind of takeaway messages and you know, how you can use that information, okay? Okay, so I think that's it for impedance. Let me just kind of scroll through one more time just to make sure that we have everything, okay? Okay, yeah, looks good. All right, so let's move on to the next topic, which is 1D equations of, of blood flow. All right. So this was an interesting unit because you know we had we had just gotten done talking about the MUP parameter modeling, uh, and so we're we're looking at, at exploring different different modeling methods. Okay. I think that's one interesting that's one really interesting thing you get from this class that you may not get from other classes is that you know we're essentially we're 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 interested in in this exact same system the entire time, right? And so we're interested in blood flow occurring in blood vessels. Okay. What we're seeing is that there are multiple different ways of doing that, right? Multiple different kinds of equation, multiple different models, and they all give you something a little bit different, okay? And so these 1D equations of blood, of blood flow, these are just yet another different model for, for, um, for simulating blood, okay? Okay. Okay. In particular, you know, the idea with the one D blood flow equations is that we want kind of something in between. Okay. And so we wanted something, um, you know, that's not as complicated as Navier Stokes. Okay. Okay. So I'll kind of I'll kind of list out the pros and cons. So the plus here is not as complicated as Navier Stokes. Okay, because Navier-Stokes is kind of like the gold standard for fluid flows. And so if you're using Navier-Stokes, that's kind of the best you can do. Uh, but Navier-Stokes is really difficult to, uh, to model. Uh, and in fact, you know, most times you have to rely on CFD, you know, which is what we covered this week. Okay? And so we want something that's going to be not as intense as Navier-Stokes. Okay? 
Uh, but at the same time, you know, we also want more spatial resolution or more spatial, uh, you know, sp more spatial, uh, uh, more spatial accuracy than love parameter models. Because love parameter models were these circuit models for, for blood flow, um, and, you know, and they're great, and they're great, you know, for, for doing very quick systems, you know, but they have a lot of limitations as well, right? So most notably, you can only compute flows and pressures at discrete locations, okay? We know, or what we're interested in is that, you know, when you, uh, when you have a, a blood vessel, you know, the things like the flow rates and the areas are going to vary kind of, you know, meter uh, centimeter by centimeter or millimeter by millimeter right and so you want to have some uh, some more uh, some more spatial resolution in order to, to tackle that okay and so what we came up with at the time was that you know uh, why don't we take the navier stokes and just integrate it or in other words average it across the cross-sectional area okay and that's the general idea and so generally speaking when you when you integrate things uh, when you integrate functions you you know at the end you're going to get a simpler function because the because uh, the integration is going to take away is going to take away at least one of the variables, okay? Um, and so you're going to get a simpler function than, than the than the other one, um, which is which which can be both a good and a bad thing, right? And so the good thing is that it's it's easier to solve most of the time, um, you know. But the bad thing is that it's uh, you know it makes it simpler as well. Okay, and so we entered in kind of the um, the really long process. Okay, and so let me go ahead and write out the uh, um, you know the Navier Stokes, and then you know we'll kind of just draw the arrow and to show you know what the what the one D equation look like. Okay, and along the way we'll talk about some of the assumptions that we made, which is you know which is really important for um, you know for uh, for this derivation. Okay. Okay, and so the one D equations the um, um, you know, um, Navier-Stokes contains, uh, you know, has two main equations. And so, first of all, we have conservation of mass. Okay. And so conservation of mass, we have one divided by R, partial, partial R, R, U, R, plus one over R, partial, partial theta, U theta plus partial U Z, partial Z is equal to zero, okay? So that's the mass equation. Okay, the momentum equation is a bit more complicated, right? And so, you know, the only, the only direction that we really worry about is the Z direction, where the Z direction is the axial direction down the length, down the length of the, of the, uh, of the pipe. Okay, and so we don't really care about anything in the in the radial direction or in the polar direction because you know we're gonna we're gonna integrate those out. Okay. All right, so for the momentum equation, we have the unsteady term. Okay, plus these are all convection terms, okay, or advection terms, depending on on your preference. All right, so that's the entire left-hand side of the equation. And on the right-hand side, we have all the viscous terms. Okay, so new over R multiplied by okay, we have partial partial R of R partial U Z 
partial R, okay, plus nu, uh, nu partial squared partial squared uz, partial z squared, okay, plus nu over r squared, partial squared uz, partial theta squared, okay? All right, so this, so this is just, you know, straight up Navier-Stokes. And so this is the full Navier-Stokes equations, um, you know, in, in cylindrical coordinates just for the z direction, okay? And so what we did was we uh, was we worked on these equations. So you know we applied our, our derivation here, okay. And so what we did from this is we integrated. We integrated across the uh, the vessel cross section. Uh, and we had to make a lot of assumptions along the way, right? All right, so first of all, we had to assume that um, we had no polar dependence. So, and so our flow is axisymmetric. Okay, so that means partial partial theta is equal to zero, okay? We assume that the pressure was. Uh, um, we assume that the pressure was uh, uniform across a cross section. Okay. And we had to assume that uh, we had a no slip boundary condition at the wall, but not that the wall was necessarily rigid. We just, we just assume that the fluid velocity matches the wall velocity, okay? Okay. Oh, one very important one. And so, you know, eventually through our derivation, we, we reached a point where we couldn't continue because we had a UZ factor, right? And so in order to proceed past that, we had to assume a shape for uz, okay? So we basically had to assume uh, the functional form of uz, uh, which is a parabolic profile, okay? Okay, okay and so in the end, in the end, we get the following, okay? So I drew, I drew that error way too short, okay? And so in the end, you know, we get, we get a, a, a solution here, but our, our, uh, um, our variables are changed, right? And so we're no longer working with just the velocities. We're now working with flow rates and areas. And so our two equations now look like this, okay? So this is the first equation, and this resulted as a, as a result of conservation of mass. Okay. And then we also have the momentum equation. So partial Q, partial T plus partial partial Z, four over three, Q squared over A plus A over rho partial P partial Z. This is equal to minus eight pi nu Q over A plus nu partial squared Q partial Z squared, okay? Where this is our conservation momentum. Okay, and so you can see here our, our variables have changed. And so we're not longer just solving for velocity, 
Here our unknowns are the area as well as the flow rate. Okay, so area, so A here stands for cross-sectional area. Okay, and Q here, Q here stands for flow rate. Okay. Right, so these so these quantities are you know obviously a lot different compared to our um, you know compared to our original Navier Stokes, but you know because we're we were integrating Navier Stokes across the cross section, you know this is the result, and so this is essentially what we uh, what we obtain. Okay, and so um, yeah, and so you know that's the uh, that's the one D equation. Of course, you know we're not quite done yet, and so you know in order to fully solve this equation, you know we need something for p as well. And so the way that we obtained something for P uh, was we use what's called a constitutive equation. Okay. And so you know uh, you don't you don't have to know the details about these about this equation, but think of it as like an additional. Uh, equation that we need to, to close the system, right? And so, because we have three unknowns here, technically we have area, flow rate, and P as all unknowns. And so this pressure, this pressure equation, we need one, we need one more for that, okay? And so essentially what the constitutive equation does is that it relates P, that was awful, okay? And so what it does, what the constitutive equation uh, does, it, it relates P, to the cross-sectional area, okay? So it makes a relationship between the two. All right, and so I think that's it for 1D equations. Uh, I don't really have anything more to say on that, right? And so let's go ahead and move on to our last topic for today, which is oscillating flow in a rigid vessel, okay? Okay, so oscillating flow in a rigid vessel, you know, we this is where we kind of made the jump from uh, 1D to uh, to 2D, okay? Because what we're interested in, in looking for here is the velocity profile across a uh, across a vessel. And so, you know, we, we kind of made this journey where like, you know, for, for the lower, I would say the lower order uh, modeling methodologies like lump parameter networks and, uh, uh, and 1D equations, we neglected the velocity just, just for the sake of simplicity, right? Uh, while that's great for allowing us to get, you know, good equations, but it also is very limiting in terms of what we can compute, okay? And so let me kind of illustrate what I mean here. And so for velocity distributions, you know, what we're interested in is, you know, what does the velocity actually look like in a blood vessel like this, okay? And so normally the profile that we're, that most people associate with internal flows, like blood flow, is the parabolic profile, right? And so this right here is the uh, Poisson, uh, Poisson solution. Right, very nice and parabolic. But this is only this this only occurs when we have steady flow. Okay. Um, 
And so, you know, we want to relax this assumption because, you know, we know, we know for a fact that flow in the cardiovascular system is not steady at all, right? And so we want to see, you know, how does the unsteadiness affect the velocity profile? And so is it still going to retain the parabolic shape or is it going to look something different? Okay. Uh, and so what you'll see later on, you know, and we'll cover this very soon, is that when you have unsteadiness, you know, there's, there's this kind of balance. And so there's a balance between the oscillating forces as well as the inertia of the, of the plane. Okay. Uh, but before we get there, you know, let me, uh, let me just kind of mention really quick that one of the big advantages to getting the velocity profile is that it allows us to compute the wall shear stress. Because really the only accurate way to compute wall shear stress is to compute it based off the derivative of the velocity profile. Okay, and so the formula that we have, tau w is mu times duz dr, okay? And so if we take the derivative of the velocity and the, and the direction perpendicular to it, then we just multiply that by the viscosity to get the wall shear stress, okay? And wall shear stress is, you know, something that's very important because, you know, the cells can sense that, endothelial cells can sense that, and they can, uh, you know, and they can uh, change their behavior based on that, okay? Okay, and so once again, you know, we went through a very long derivation, okay? But the upshot that I wanted you to get at, and, and even beyond, you know, I know we spent a lot of time talking about vessel functions and, and things like that, the main takeaway that I want you to get from this section is the idea of the Walmersley number, okay? And so the Walmersley number usually is expressed as alpha squared is computed by taking omega. Omega here is the frequency of the oscillation of the flow oscillations. Okay. We multiply by L squared and we divide it by the viscosity. Okay. Right. Where L here, uh, you know, is some characteristic length, but for all of our cases, you know, because we're, we're talking about blood flow, the characteristic length is usually just the radius of the vessel. Okay. Radius or diameter, you know, it's uh, you know they both they both kind of give the same thing, right? And so the important quantity here, of course, is omega, and this is the frequency of the oscillations. Okay. And so the important thing to note here is is you know what this represents, right? And so whenever you have a, a non-dimensional number in, a, um, in, in an engineering or science application, you know, most of the time it's gonna represent a ratio of, of things, okay? And interpreting that ratio is kind of key to understanding what these non-dimensional numbers mean. Okay. And so this particular ratio for the Walmersley number on the very top, we're going to have, uh, you know, what the omega r squared represents is basically the effect of, of oscillations. I erased it and I wrote the same thing. Oscillating. Okay. Right. And so the faster your oscillations are, the stronger those effects are going to be. And on the denominator here, we have viscous effects. Okay, and so this ratio, is, this, this Walmersley number represents the ratio in between those two things, okay? And depending on the value of the Walmersley number, you know, we're going to observe different, different velocity profiles.
in particular, you know, there's two, there's kind of two regimes that I, that I want to go over as part of this review. Okay. And so number one is when the two forces are roughly balanced uh, or when the viscous effects are stronger. Okay. And so this occurs when the Walmersley number is about less than or equal to one. Okay. And so in these situations, the oscillation of viscous forces are either approximately the same or the viscous forces are higher, okay? Okay. In these situations, you know, the oscillation is usually pretty slow or, or you know, um, or, you know, what we said in the class is that, you know, the oscillations are at a speed compared to the viscosity that the velocity profile can catch up. Okay. Okay, and so in these situations, you, you actually do observe still the, the parabolic velocity profile. Okay, right, roughly speaking, it's just they're gonna they're gonna switch directions. Okay, and so as the as the pressure and as the flow kind of switches directions, so do do the profiles. But at every point in time, you know you see the parabola kind of fully developed. Okay, and so you definitely see the effects of the unsteadiness. Uh, but you know the parabola shape is is mostly preserved. Okay. Okay, so that's that's number one. Number two is the opposite case, and so the opposite case is when the oscillation is um, you know a lot a lot stronger than the viscous forces. Okay. And so this occurs when the Walmersley number is, is around double digits, right? And so if you're in double digits, that means the, the, um, the oscillatory forces are stronger, okay? Okay, and so when the oscillations are going much faster, then the parabola cannot fully develop, right? And so before the parabola can fully develop, is going to be pulled back into the other direction. Okay. And so these velocity profiles look something like this. Okay. And so typically the way these profiles uh, develop is that they start near the walls. And so the walls are the first ones to react. And then that effect propagates to the middle of the domain. And so you, know, you might get situations like this. All right. And so in this situation, you know, uh, what you can imagine is that you know, originally this velocity profile was pointing to the left, but then all of a sudden it was pulled, it was pulled over to the right, okay, due to the oscillation. And so what's happening is that near the walls here, okay, near the walls. These velocities have already reacted, right? And so they said, you know, hey, we're going the other way now. You know, let's go ahead and start moving that way. But it's taking a while for the middle to catch up, okay? Mostly because either the oscillation is too high or the viscosity is uh, is too low, okay? Right. But, you know, uh, and so you would think eventually, you know, the center would catch up. But by the time the center does try to catch up, you know, it's, it's going to face the other way already. And so, you know, very soon after, you know, you might get a profile that looks like this. Okay. Where again, you know, you have the, the walls here. So those are kind of reacting first. And so those are reacting to, you know, if the oscillation went back the other way, but the middle is having tough to a tough time to adjust. Okay. And so what some people will say is that, you know, uh, and so one, one, one profile that you see most often with this is what's called a plug profile. Okay. 
where the velocity profile kind of looks flat, okay? And so it kind of has this kind of flat top instead of a full parabola, okay? And so this type of profile is called a plug profile. <coughs> And so plug is just another shape besides parabola, okay? And so what I want you to know from this section is, you know, how, uh, you know, just kind of understand what the Walmersley number represents and how the velocity profiles react to different uh, values of the Walmersley number, okay? Uh, okay, and so that's the, that's the summary of these three units. And so that was the mathless, the mathless summary, right? So we know math here. Uh, but remember, for these sections, you know, I, I want you to focus on studying these kind of conceptual things instead, right? Okay, and so that's all we have time for today. And so I'm going to go ahead and close the review here. And so if you have any other questions about the midterm or, or anything, you know, please don't hesitate to ask. All right, so best of luck studying for everyone. And I will see you guys next week.